Hello and welcome to The Found Cause, where we found our cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my right, your left is... Sebastian, the archivist. And across the airwaves, it's... Edor, under the PC, under the person of Christ. Dear said I'm a little quiet, so I'm quite on your end, dear viewer. You can comment and tell me to, to get louder. Um, I feel very loud, but uh, my mic might not be. We are here to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, to Theodore's heart, and even to Sebastian's heart. Um, it's politics. I, we had we had a political episode like four, four episodes ago where we had the guy from the radio come on. and It was a little too political for me, honestly. But we posted it because why not? Um, I think pol political podcasts are not a rare thing in the world. Uh, never have been, still aren't today, probably more now than ever. So we don't need to be just another talking head. This episode is airing right after uh, the first debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. And so we contemplated as a podcast, should we do a response to that? You know, we do a response every other episode. And I thought, um, one, it was kind of a lame debate, so kind of a boring response video. But two, I, I think one of the biggest issues, in my opinion, that this country has in its politics is that politics is often a gossip game where you're talking about who slept with who, who said a funny thing, did you see their underpants sticking out of their, their butt when they were climbing the ladder to the plane? It's all this like very vapid vein stuff. Plus, it is um, like a little bit of policy thrown in, right? And typically, so you have the, the gossip stuff, which we know we should not, in case you're wondering out there, you should not be making decisions based on gossip stuff. It's, it's dumb it, from both sides. And 100%, both sides are very, very guilty of hyping up gossip stuff. I don't care if Kamala Harris wears a wig or is secretly white. I, I don't care. And and similarly, if Donald Trump is actually, you know, kicks babies in his spare time, unless he actually belongs in prison and like you're mad that he should be in prison, and which some would claim, um, putting that aside, it shouldn't affect who you vote for. You might, you might not like them, but it shouldn't affect who you vote for. Um, the the thing that bothers me most, besides the gossip stuff, is that the policies, when, when you get down to the 10% the of the time that we're discussing policies and politics, the things we discuss are never Bible-based. It's always, should the tax rate be 20% or 32%? And that kind of boring, frankly, boring discussion turns Christians off because Christians go, well, I don't know if the tax rate should be 20% or 30 Like I'm, I may have an opinion, but it's really because Sean Hannity said that if the tax rate was 32%, the GDP would drop by 10%. And if the tax rate is 20%, the GDP will rise by 5%. It's some like, you know, numbers game where people are quoting different stats at you and showing you charts. And it's, it's just not agreeable. Uh, Christians from many different walks, uh, many different wisdom metrics, many different mathematical capacities would disagree on what policies are best when you are debating that way, when you're debating with facts and figures and sociological studies and what have you. And, and that's why most Christians today, agreeable Christians today, will say, well, politics is a realm that we have to agree to disagree because how can we possibly convict a Christian based off of these sociological studies and whatever else, like a, a well-intended, joyful, God-loving Christian could mistakenly be voting for a worse policy because they don't know better. Um, fair enough. However, as you've heard in this podcast before, and I think it's crucial for the state of our nation, and, and more importantly, for the state of the church, disagreement on politics has led to insane divides in church. Um, probably more than we give credit to because if disagreements in politics can often boil over to disagreements in theology, uh, personal disagreements, and personal disagreements, I actually think, are the biggest reason churches split. It's pastor drama and member drama and somebody offended somebody else, and that's why churches split typically. It's not, it's not major theological policies. Um, and when you disagree politically, you are at disunity, and often that can boil over to just general anger and distrust and whatever else. And so I think... Um, we should very carefully approach the realm of politics, which is super divisive in the United States, as Christians to figure out if it, if it truly is something that we should leave alone and let simmer under the surface and boil over in church splits and anger, or if we should come to a way that we can come to unity on the way we think about politics. Um, my rant should end with this. I am a strong believer, and you've heard on this podcast before, that Christians can come to some, at least an attempted unity if we base all of our politics, and I mean 100% of our politics, on what the Bible has to say about righteousness, what's good, what's evil. If we base any, and I mean any of our politics, not on the Bible, 
we will be right back in the ma of society where we're quoting facts and figures and and talking heads and the latest tabloid news and we will be right back at each other's throats well-intended christians will be on both sides of politics when they shouldn't be i i both democrats and republicans and libertarians and whatever your party is in your home country they are very very guilty of not using the bible for the basis of their politics and so um uh, my rant over this episode is really to remind you what why i think that christians can come to at least baseline agreements on what politics and policies should be for a nation if we base it purely off the bible even though there might be like well-intended differences in how we interpret the bible at least we're both trying to base our policies and political views off the same thing i also think the bible is really slim on what it says about politics it means it, the the category of things to talk about is so much slimmer we'll get done with politics and like two sermons at church and then it can be done you know it can be settled i mean anybody that comes in and tries to cause controversy we can refer to two sermons we did in politics it should be really simple um whereas modern political commentary is reams and reams and reams of of politics um this was also triggered because sebastian has some thoughts on how the law applies in the modern day which i think are creative and theodore wanted to talk about this because he's got some family members who say they're well-intended christians and they want to vote the way that theodore's not voting they want to vote democrat and theodore's a republican Theodore, I think you have more to say about this as far as like why you think some well-intended Christians are voting Democrat and why some are voting Republican. And before you dive in, we want to establish the foundations. You said the Bible speaks briefly on politics, but if you give me the book of Revelation, I mean, I don't know how the heck I can apply like a seven-headed beast to that. <laughs> like, what do you mean when you say the Bible speaks on politics? Uh, I specifically am referencing God's law and the law in light of Jesus Christ coming. So the first five books of the Bible are typically called the law, the Torah in Hebrew. Um, a lot of it is not law. So a lot of Genesis, for example, is the first book of the Bible. It doesn't have anything to do with God's law. But there are parts of Genesis that speak to laws that God says all people must obey. And in Leviticus, which is a book about Levi, the Levitical law, um, it gives a lot of laws. And in Deuteronomy, which means this second giving of the law, that's the Greek meaning of Deuteronomy, uh, it also gives laws that God gave to Israel. Um, and it can be a whole discussion on whether or not those laws are binding on us today, um, which people disagree on. But whether or not you think they are valid today, we have to agree that God gave them at some point and they were good. And we also have to agree that they are the largest commentary the Bible has on what God thinks it was good politics. And so at least it should be the basis of how we inform our politics today. Even if you don't agree with me on whether or not it's still valid today, you know, whatever. Um, we, we can agree to disagree on that. But we do know that Jesus said all of the law, the old law, that God's law in the Testament is based on love your neighbor and love God. And we all agree that's currently valid law for Christians. And so that's what I mean by law is God's commands in the first five books of the Bible. So there's a distinction between being literal or following the spirit of the law. Didn't like Paul randomly cite like don't muscle the ox and apply it to something that has nothing to do with ox or muscling? Yeah, and this even came up on that episode with Theodore's guest star where um, he, he, and he's not unique in this, um, said as a christian he said he didn't think that the law had any application in the modern day and even if you don't agree with me that it still is valid and binding on us um in light of christ of course you at least have to agree that paul quotes the law flippantly meaning like he doesn't get he doesn't qualify oh uh, the law is totally invalid except for this one thing i'm about to quote to you he quotes it in corinthians when he's talking about paying your pastors he says you should pay your pastors because they're doing a good work for you as the law says don't muzzle the ox as it treads about your corn as it treads about the wheat um, whatever your translation says uh so it's a it's a seemingly random agricultural law that paul calls out of nowhere with no qualifications and he applies it not to talk about cows eating corn um, but instead about pastors getting paid um, meaning that he takes a case law, which is exactly the way the law was designed to be taken. He takes the case law, which is pay your animals with the fruit of their labor. Oxes are helping you tread the field with corn in it. Let them eat some of the corn in the same way the pastor's working for you. So pay him. Um, that's the way the law is supposed to be interpreted. So that's not arguing. We should take God's law, the first five books of the Bibles, his commands there, and apply them in that way to uh, the modern day. And that's 
post Jesus ascension to heaven. That's interestingly part. enough. So it's not about justifying us before God. It's not about making us righteous people. We know that we are only righteous because of the blood of Christ, and we cannot fulfill the law in and of ourselves, even post Jesus. It's God that does it for us. So it's that whole discussion is not even under debate here either. It's purely how do we make modern politics work well? And I'm Ooh. trying to base modern politics on God's law. Cool. Yeah, we've done episodes. We've done a couple episodes on that. So if you want more in depth on like why why I have that opinion, you can look to other episodes. This episode is really like assuming you know that. Let's talk about specifics. So Theodore, you had some thought on modern Christian Democrats and modern Christian Republicans and their underlying values. Yeah, and just to go back. Um, I don't know, four minutes ago, <laughs> when you mentioned something about churches preaching about politics and uh, people splitting over that or whatever, and how churches might only have to preach like two sermons, and uh, people can reference those. And funny enough, the church that I attend, <laughs> they have, they're doing two sermons uh, politically related. Uh, first one was this past Sunday, uh, second one will be this coming Sunday. And uh, I was unfortunately watching online um, this past Sunday and one person commented at the end of the sermon this sucks <laughs> and that's all <laughs> nice so Constructive. that kind of shows you how people have strong opinions they're even willing to post in the live church YouTube chat this sucks and I don't believe anybody else commented uh, but there's that like I said so, it engender strong feelings yeah. So the question I was wondering is why some Christians are staunch Democrats, why some Christians are staunch Republicans. Mm -hmm. And it, you might not be like identify as part of the political party, but you might vote generally for the platform of one or the other. Um, and I was thinking Christian Democrats and my family member, uh, like this, uh, wants to accept all immigrants and give them free food, free education, free housing, etc. So basically, welfare, it's the Jesus multiplying the loaves and fishes, giving food to everyone. Um, and then the Christian Republicans, uh, I think more so want to protect uh, the innocent. They believe government is more for uh, protection of the innocent uh, from sexualization, indoctrination, crime, um, and protecting the individual liberty of people. And just to reference uh, Quora, uh, the Ask Whatever website, one of the Ask Whatever websites, this person who said he is not remotely religious, um, but has taken a lot of interest in this topic, uh, answered the question, what political ideology would Jesus Christ follow? And he said, um, after reading the Bible many times from his perspective, Jesus is not socialist, not capitalist, um, but he promotes individualism and volunteerism. Um, which he says are not, Never mind. <laughs> so basically individual, individual liberties and promoting um, charity, uh, goodwill, um, but not forced, not taking from people. And so those are basically the two uh, viewpoints, I think. Yeah, and as cliche as it might be, the question of what political party is Jesus, you know, what political alignment is Jesus, is an important one because we should be the same political alignment as Jesus. Um, I think we should all agree. Um, some people, I think Christians would maybe disagree because they're like, well, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, so how could he possibly have an opinion on modern politics? Um, I think that's I think that's a naive opinion because of course Jesus is God. So of course he has an opinion on modern politics. He's seen all of time. And so righteousness has not changed. The standard for what is good and what is evil has not changed um, for 2,000 years. Or earlier, you know, God is the same yesterday and today and forever. So uh, from the Gospels, what, what do we like specifically glean about Jesus' opinions? Well, there's two 
political parties in his day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I would equate them pretty similar to the Republicans and Democrats as far as one of them was seen as progressive and liberal and pushing the country towards modern politics, which was the Sadducees. And one was seen as conservative and preserving of religious um, truth and um, tradition and wanting to take the country into a nationalist, self-reliant state, which, which was the Pharisees. Um, both groups should be pretty notorious to Christians because Pharisees are saying about in every Sunday school as being some of the villains of the Gospels. And I would say they most closely resemble Republicans as far as wanting to preserve religious tradition and wanting to keep the country nationalist and um, like self-reliant. And so uh, I don't think, if, uh, I don't just think, Jesus didn't attack the Pharisees for trying to preserve good law or for nationalism. So uh, if you attack Republicans for trying to preserve religious tradition and nationalism, you aren't following Jesus's example, but he does fight them when they add traditions to the law, right? That's a, kind of exclusively where he fights them is one, they're rejecting him, and two, they add a bunch of traditions that aren't actually the law. And if you look at modern day Republicans, I think you can do the same thing and, and say that Republicans advocate for a lot of laws that are excessive. They are not righteousness. So Republicans famously are pretty pro-prison, pro-police, and as much as there is righteousness in the government wielding a sword and having justice and pros prosecuting crimes, I, kind of stereotypically, and I think truthfully, Republicans over-prosecute for crimes. They, they say that if you steal, you should be prosecuted and go to prison, where you, the state will pay for you to eat and drink and stay in a prison, and the person you stole from will get nothing um, negative because they'll probably have to go like testify and take some of the time out of their day to go testify just to have, see you get paid by their tax money. What a terrible system. And Republicans are pro that. They're pro hurting the person who stole because now they have their life taken away. They're, they're thrown into prison. They don't do anything. They probably become a better criminal because they're around a bunch of criminals there. They're not learning true livelihood producing things. Um, all, all the stats about prison would say that, but more importantly, the Bible has no prison as a punishment. There is no prison punishment in the Bible. Um, some people get thrown into prison in unrighteous nations like Daniel in uh, the Median, Median Empire, right? He gets thrown into the lion's den. That's not a righteous punishment. Likewise, Joseph is thrown into prison in Egypt, and that's not a righteous punishment. That's Egypt, Egyptian law, not Israeli, not God's law. There is no prison in God's law. So when Republicans push for prison, they are acting a lot like Pharisees and adding tradition to God's word. Um, but likewise, so I think most people don't remember the, the Sadducees, but the Sadducees are a party so detached from the Bible that they weren't even a temptation for people to associate Jesus with the Sadducees. He comes from a region that the Sadducees weren't powerful in. Galilee is the stronghold of the Pharisees. And he also, it's so obvious that he's not a Sadducee that he doesn't really have to differentiate himself very much from the Sadducees, but because he's insulting the Pharisees, this, this is straight from the Gospels, because he is insulting the Pharisees and the Pharisees don't like Jesus, the Sadducees approach him thinking, well, <laughs> if he's not a Pharisee, he must be one of us, right? Because there's only two options. But they didn't, that's kind of weird. They hadn't approached him all this time because they thought he was conservative, because he was. Uh, so they approach him um, and to check him out <laughs> to see, well, if you're not a Pharisee, you must be a Sadducee. And he rebukes them and says they don't read the scriptures, they don't even understand that God, of course, is one more than the five first, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, and they didn't really believe that God was real, they believed he was like the cultural unity that the Jews had, and that's why they only respected Moses. Not God, but Moses, and Moses wrote the first five books, and so they believed the first five books. Jesus says, have you not read what God spoke to you? He, he rebukes them, saying that God spoke these things to you, and says that there is a spirit there's a real bodily resurrection. God will do miraculous things. And so they, you know, zip off after that and never attack him again until they, you know, condemn him to death, um, which they do do, by the way. In case you're wondering, in case you think the Sadducees are the good guys because they're the Democrats, um, they 100% across the board voted for Jesus to die, whereas the Pharisees are the ones that split and were trying to decide what they were going to do with him. And now eventually the Pharisees also vote that he die. Uh, you know, had to happen. But the Pharisees are the ones that at least were considering letting Jesus live. The Sadducees were all aboard death to the Messiah. Um, so which which side is better? I question you. <laughs> uh, the absolute Jesus haters who didn't believe in God that wanted to become Greek and progressive? Um, no. Uh, the Pharisees, they weren't good either. So let's not pretend like Pharisees were great people. Um, but 
I say all that to say it's really important what Jesus thought about politics because he was absolutely facing a very similar political environment to today and with really similar issues, actually. Yeah, so a lot of ranting going on. Let's talk about some specific issues. Uh, you mentioned, Theodore, in the differences between modern Christian Democrats and modern Christian Republicans, welfare, that Christian Democrats advocate that we should be giving like free or subsidized, somehow helping people get housing, food, um, education to immigrants, but obviously to citizens as well. Um, where, when we look at the Bible and the first five books of the Bible, God's law, what does God have to say about the poor and the needy? Let's look. Let's read. Oh, just, okay. Yeah. Oh, there's there so many from jesusfilm.org from crew with it. I just learned. Making provisions from Leviticus 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. That's one. We can stop or I can just yeah, keep going. Let, let's stop to say just this. I think naturally when people who vote Democrat hear about the law, they go, eh. you know, they, there's some violent reaction and they go no 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 republicans do this too honestly the guy we had the radio show host who was super republican um super republican he also was like no 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 when he heard about the law i think the law is offensive to a lot of people because they're worried the law is going to be like the nastiest thing you've ever heard um they're worried it's going to be like you know debt to everyone straight up everybody has to be in straight jackets and wear tassels on their tails and things like that um that what you just heard is from the law um, love your neighbor as yourself is from the law that things that Jesus quoted were often just from the law. Lend to somebody who asks you is from the law. So the law is not like, ah, death to everyone, stone everyone. If you ever get your foot out of line, you're dead. In fact, I would say it's less, less punishment for things we give more punishment for today. Way less rules in the law than we have today. Yes. Um, People so. are thinking of Islamic law. That's the one that they cut off your hand if you steal. Or in the law. Mm. Yeah. In the law, if you steal... Prison is extreme and unjust, as I have said many times before. You have to pay twice, up to four times what you've stolen. So that that's from the Old Testament law. And there's bankruptcy in there. There's no interest loans in God's law. And then this one, what, you, what Sebastian just read, is the provisions that nobody goes hungry. Right? We think about trying to feed people in the United States. This was the prescribed welfare for hunger in Israel by God. So this is God's prescription for how people should be fed, at least for Israel, which at least we can try to model today, um, was to for landowners who had money, had food, to leave the very edges of their fields, not the main portion of their crop, but the very edges of their field and any things that dropped, any like extras that they forgot about in the field so that the poor could come and collect it. What was fascinating from this article is that the Israelites weren't the only nation in the near ancient Near East that didn't harvest the edges, but those nations left their unharvested produce as a sacrifice for their gods. And then the law of Yahweh was different. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. And it's also it's Yahweh's ensuring that the foreigners and old poor people have means to eat. And being poor back then was, in my humble opinion, as an amateur historian, was worse than being poor today in the United States worse than being poor today in the United States. Yeah, you think of the poor in the U.S. today and they have a lot, right? Like we, we think of it being really bad to have to live out in the boonies where, instead of the city or um, having a really small apartment or having to share with your mom and your grandma or um, not being able to eat out and have private chefs serve you meals at McDonald's. Like it is hard because <laughs> we're used to private chefs feeding us on a regular basis, but that was definitely not what they had back in the day. Back in the day, it truly was life or death. If you had a, a coat for winter or not, meant whether or not you would die um, in the winter. Whereas today, homeless people have more coats than me. You know, <laughs> they're out there with like five coats because they found them in the dumpster or the street or somebody gave it to them. So it's typically not a matter of life and death in the United States just because poverty, true poverty has been so alleviated by God's blessing in this nation. Um, Still poor people, of course, but they are only relatively poor to us, not compared to these people. So then you may be wondering, is how does it how could this law possibly apply to our modern day and age? Could you get anything to justify um, state sponsored welfare from this? I would be of the opinion that not. What you can get from this modern day application, which I am in the spirit of the law, I do believe in that, is for example, a lot of food 
goes to waste in in the in this country which was sad as a peruvian you see i see actually a lot of starving people in in peru in, in latin america so with no food and the amount of food that gets thrown away that's not consumed and it's perfectly fine food it's just extra and then they, they either the owners they don't want to sell it they don't want to keep it there there may be federal regulations that prevent you so people don't sue for getting food poisoning what have you and modern day equivalent of that would be having these restaurants leave their perfectly fine food outside and then the homeless people can come and pick that up you can come up with all sorts of excuses oh that may be dangerous you're attracting homeless people well what you're attracting homeless people to your farm in ancient israel by ha by leaving the fields untouched at the end poor sad foreigners or just poor israelites i would say that would be a modern application that i was fascinated and pondering if you agree or disagree put it down below in the comments but i think that will be a one-to-one -one example that the ancient law applies to the modern world and famously just fun bible connection here ruth in the book of ruth uses this law to get her food when she moves back to israel and it's just her and her mother-in-law so they're not particularly skilled wealthy people how are they going to eat well <laughs> She, uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law, says to go to a relative's field who's righteous, and because he's righteous, he is keeping his, the edges of his field ungleaned, and he's not picking up the extras that his harvesters miss when they drop a, a sheave of wheat, and Ruth is picking up that food to feed her and her mother-in-law. So this was actively used for biblical characters, uh, in case you're wondering, as it, like, it is real law that was applied and helped Ruth um, ultimately get married, but just have enough food to eat as well. I, I think what's interesting about this law to me, too, is that I would naturally be inclined in the modern day that it's, it's not just for people who own a field of wheat. It's for people who have any excess money that you should be leaving portions of it um, that you don't need to give to the poor somehow. However, what's interesting about this law is that it doesn't say collect the, the edges of your field and collect the things that drop in the ground and then distribute them to the poor or leave them in a big barrel for the poor to pick up. It says leave them there for the poor to come and collect, which it certainly wasn't a, a modern advancement that allowed us to collect things and then distribute them to the poor. Like they, they could have absolutely distributed to the poor back then too, and God doesn't have them do that. I think there is something to be said about the poor people going and getting it um, from your field that has like a relational benefit for the poor people and for the, the person giving it to. Um, and most all of God's law, when it has giving to the poor involved in it, it's a very personal thing. It's a personal, like you are giving specifically to this poor person, you're giving them a loan, you're having a relationship with them, you're being not tight-fisted with them. It has as much to do with alleviating the person's poverty as it also has to do with the rich person gaining something via charity. And so if you take away either the personal relationship of the giving or the work that the poor person had to put in to go get the, the food, um, I think you lose something from this law. And so I think it's unwise to, to take a modern application of this law to saying that it should be a portion of your income that gets distributed by the government to the poor because it loses a lot of those points um, that, the, that the law originally had. And see this for yourselves in Leviticus 25. If any of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them but fear your God, so that they may continue to live among you. Deuteron Deuteronomy 15. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. I mean, I can keep going. Also in Deuteronomy 15, keep go keeps going. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. What I found fascinating now reading this, this for the second time, not during the ep for, the, for the sake of the episode, is that there will always be poor people in the land. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's fascinating to consider you can share your thoughts in, in the comments too that part of the not just in the u.s but any social democrat program in scandinavia or europe would be with a goal to eradicate poverty i think in fact that's part of the u.n like charter of yep. goals if 
I think that's what it's called, could be called something else. But to the best of my knowledge, until the return of Jesus Christ, who is an absolute monarch, by the way, in establishes his kingdom, I don't think you would be able to, there's any provisions in his law or the New Testament to eradicate poverty. Right. And so in the U.S. too, the, the welfare system was put in called, it was called the War on Poverty, put in by Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 60s, president of the U.S. Um, so yes, it's definitely a goal of modern leaders to eradicate poverty. And like you just said, Sebastian, not that it's not a noble goal, but the Bible explicitly tells us that it is a futile goal. You will never eliminate poverty because ultimately, and as we just talked about, it's not poverty necessarily that you are fighting when you distribute food and clothing. Um, you are definitely feeding and clothing people. And so like we just discussed in the United States, you are food, you have food, you have shelter, you have clothing if you want it in the United States. You could refuse it for a multitude of reasons because you want to continue destructive lifestyles and they won't let you have the free food if you continue to do drugs or you don't want to reconnect with your family and so you're homeless. There's a lot of situations like that. You're unwilling to get a roommate. You know, there's a lot of situations where people might be unsheltered, be hungry, be clothless, but they they will not accept charity or they won't accept the natural ways to get those things. But um, they would still be considered poor because they are poorer than somebody who's rich in the U.S. because um, wealth has increased greatly in the U.S. and across the whole world. Um, poverty looks a lot less poor than it did in the 2000 AD or um, BC or you know 2000 years ago. <laughs> uh, so in that way, you could say we've eradicated poverty, except there are definitely still poor among us. And so the Bible is true that there are still the poor among us today, even though we have greatly increased in wealth and those poor are much richer than they used to be. They're still poor because there's always going to be strata. There's always going to be a, a difference between the richest and the poorest. That is the way God has designed the world. Some people will work harder than others. Some people will be stolen from, right? I mean, there's, there's reasons why poor and rich will exist forever because sin exists and because that, because sin exists and differences in people exist, there will always be richer people and poorer people. However, if you also notice another interesting thing in these laws is that it's always a act that you should give from the kindness of your heart. It has to be something that a righteous person, I would say nowadays in the modern day, someone has been transformed by the righteous blood of Jesus Christ should experience that desire in their heart to help someone who is in need. Not out of like compulsion from Yahweh, like holding a gun at, at your head, but from the genuine love and compassion that the law is, I think, is, it's getting at. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I think you talked about this before, forcing people to, with some tax system, to fund either healthcare or provide food or shelter, or whatnot, doesn't quite meet that requirement that God is go is looking at going for in the law. And, you know, I, like I said, we should stay away from sociological studies, but um, so so I won't even quote them, right? I, this isn't even using weird sociological studies to show that these are bad welfare systems. This is purely going off of what the Bible has to say. In three verses, uh, to back up what Sebastian said, uh, these are all letters uh, from Paul. Second, uh, Second Corinthians 9, verse 7, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart not uh, grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. Philippians 4, 12 to 13. You know, uh, oh, I guess this pertains in another way, but I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any, situ in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So that's all saying um, he has learned to be content in any situation and he's learned that because he has been in every situation mm -hmm. being hungry uh, having plenty etc and then he writes to Philemon uh, chapter 1 verse 14 but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might be not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. So this is just again pointing at um, the Christian way is not compulsive. 
uh, or compulsing, requiring, uh, uh, demanding, it, whatever. And it's it will, yeah, and I'll cheerfully. qualify that, um, that that stands out that it is that it is not compulsive because the Christian way can be compulsive. God's law can be compulsive. I think the notorious parts of the law that make people go, ah, I hate the law, are compulsive, right? That God demands that you put to death murderers, right? He says, if somebody is convicted by two to three witnesses, you go through a proper trial, you make sure you have proper evidences. People who falsely accuse people of murder should be put to death themselves. They should be charged with the crime they falsely accuse people of. So all of these protections in place. If you are righteously convicted of murder, you should be put to death. And, there, and you should not have pity. It's specifically said, like, don't have pity on the murderer. Excise the evil from among you. It was evil that this person killed somebody. You're righting the wrong by, by killing them. Um, they paid what they took. The, the, the death penalty there is obviously by force. So there are some Christians who say that, that no Christian law, no modern law should ever be compulsive. They're like anarchists or whatever. Um, clearly the law and God's law is not afraid of being compulsive, of using the sword to punish evildoers. Romans 13 talks about that. There are many famous Bible passages that talk about that it's good that the government, even the wicked Roman government, wields the sword to punish evildoers. So it's not that the law is against punishing people for doing unrighteous things, but it specifically doesn't punish people for some of these things that are still unrighteous. So in this case of leaving gleanings for the field, um, or, or not being stingy to your brother or charging your brother interest. Those things are wicked. We, we shouldn't charge our brother interest. We shouldn't not leave gleanings of our field. We shouldn't be stingy to the poor. But there's no civil penalty for not doing these things. There's an eternal hellfire penalty. Yes, there's hellfire. So if you're greedy in this life and you commit no other sin, you will end up in hell because of the evil of your heart for not the, the, the hatred towards your brother. So there's that. But you're right putting out there's no civil, legal, whatever you want to call it, penalty or execution or demand to like retribution, whatever word you want to use for not giving charity to others. And, and I think don't miss how rebellious that point is um, compared to our modern law um, when a well-intending grandma who just republican or democrat frankly and they just want to levy a tax for some well-intended cause they say we should increase taxes on gains capital some obscure thing that will only affect one percent of the population at most um, so that we can feed the orphans of the United States. Some great cause, and it's barely going to hurt anybody, and everybody is waving the flag, and they're saying, hey, man, this is the best policy ever. <laughs> Remember what they're actually telling you to do. They are saying, and if they're Christian, so say it's a Christian grandma who's, who's claiming this is good Christian law, um, she is claiming that under force of government penalty, because the government doesn't mess around when it comes to taxes, there's no voluntary taxes in the U.S., you either pay them or you're under a penalty of um, jail time and and uh, fines, you must pay this tax. We're going to take the money from you and give it to others. Um, not only is that system of confiscation never given in the law of God, even tithe, even the taxes of God's law, which there are taxes in God's law, are voluntarily given. They're not, they're not excised by the state. You give them. So God commands that you give them. You give these 10% taxes to the poor and to the Levite priests, the government at the time, they didn't have a penalty for not giving them. It is unrighteous in God's law to give a penalty. So when a grandma says, no, actually, it's righteous that the government punish my neighbor, punish me if I don't give charity, they are convicting you of something that the Bible convicts the other way around, that the Bible does not convict you of. And so they may look innocent, they may, they may feel innocent when they say that there should be some tiny, tiny, tiny tax levied for some great and noble cause. Know that they are actually advocating for something that the Bible would, would say you should not convict Christians of righteousness. So that grandma is saying that it is, um, she's convicting other Christians of something that the Bible does not convict them on. And I think as Christians that advocate for policies, we should be really careful what we advocate as good policy because um, there's only two ways you can handle politics in the United States. Any, any political thing you advocate for, because it's not a fact of science or a way of working, um, it is a judgment call on what is good and what is bad. If you say there should be a 10% tax on foodstuffs, you are saying it is righteous 
it's a matter of righteousness, right and wrong, right? It should be, be an act of jail time. If you don't have this happen, there should be some sort of punishment. If you don't do this, it's a matter of righteousness that you have this 10% sales tax or whatever. Insert your law that would be punishable by something in the government. If you, if you do that, you're either saying the Bible doesn't speak clear enough to what is good and bad, and so we had to make this other thing up because we knew more about what was good and bad than the Bible, which sounds a lot like Adam and Eve in the garden, doesn't it? Um, or you're saying the Bible does speak clearly on this, and the Bible does say we need a 10% tax on groceries, or a, you know, insert your random policy that clearly is not in the Bible. And so, um, when the grandma, again, I'm just going to go back to the grandma, so when the kindly Christian grandma is asking for a 10% tax or a 1% tax on capital gains or something really minor so that she cannot be starving in her old age, remember that she is actually convicting you that either the Bible didn't know it was good, and so she had to come up with this thing because the Bible didn't know it was right and wrong, or that the Bible does say this is right. The Bible does command us to give 10% of our capital gains to grandmas. Um, so she's making a political, very theological statement when she pushes for that, whether she knows it or not. And that's why I think we, when we advocate for political policies, we should be very careful with what we convict people to do because um, it's, it's a very meaningful theological statement when we say a policy should be enacted or shouldn't be. And so I am of the strong conviction that we should keep our political opinions to a minimum um, because they're really serious and that we shouldn't we shouldn't avoid biblical law but we should only advocate for biblical law we shouldn't go more than god's law but we shouldn't go less than god's law that's what i advocate for because if we go less than god's law we don't enact god's laws we are disregarding the wisdom that he's given us that's bad i would say it's more evil to go above god's law than to go under god's law but either way it's it's bad you're a pharisee or a sadducee So we've talked about welfare. Um, you had mentioned, Theodore, the Republican Christians advocate for the protection of the innocent like on the abortion issue. Is that something that the Bible speaks to? Um, yeah, let me see uh, in my notes here. This isn't really <clears throat> an abortion episode, but we all know a dividing line between Republicans and Democrats in the United States is the abortion issue. Um, it, it is no secret. It's not even it's not even a mixed bag that the Democrats are pro-abortion and that the Republicans are not pro-abortion. I would not call the Republicans these days pro-life. They took it off their, their platform, so they officially are not pro-life, but um, their Democrats are pro-abortion. So um, are there people who are pro-life to vote Democrat? Yeah, but um, clearly that is not their number one priority. Which, honestly, we said this on the episode with the radio host guy, too. We will always have to make a compromise when we vote for one political party in the U.S. because one of them is not Jesus. So they're going to get something wrong. Um, they're not even trying to, to adhere to the law. So, of course, they get a lot of things wrong. Um, so I understand why you might compromise on one item, abortion, for to vote Democrat. But what, what are you getting? <laughs> like, So you sacrificed your kid to, to Baal. Are you getting something in return? Or are you just... Like when the the pagan Israelites sacrificed their children to Baal, do you think they got stuff in return? I, mean, I don't think they even got anything in return. So I wonder when we sacrifice our children to Baal, we're making a sacrifice. We're saying, yes, it should be. I'll vote for the, the party that actively is trying to make baby murder legal in the U.S. But I'm getting what? Like that's I, I would just want to know what, what the sacrifice is for and if it's worth it. Like when I say I'm voting Republican this year, um, I'm saying I am voting for um, willing ignorance uh, and willing non-abolition of killing of babies, right? A party that is not willing to abolish the killing of babies in the U.S. I understand that sacrifice. They are weak on that issue. But what I am getting is somebody who at least is trying to tax us less, at least is trying to reduce the size of government tyranny, right? Things getting closer to God's law on that front. So I'm like, well, that's what I'm getting in return for voting for a weaker party on abortion. On the note of abortion... I would say for New Testament times, the Didache, great book, so short, teachings of the 12 apostles, says do not abort. So even in the early church, the, the second after Jesus just leaves the planet, the early church said, please don't abort your babies because that's bad. That's a way to death. In the Old Testament, Exodus 21, 
When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. But there is, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Implying that if the baby comes out and there's harm to the baby, mm-hmm. if eye for an eye or death, life for life. So meaning the baby is alive. And defended with the rights of a person. I've heard it. Jewish people, but Jews come in every stripe, so super liberal Jews, um, quote that passage and say that that is talking about the woman, so not the baby, but if the woman is injured in this scuffle, um, that you have to pay her life for life, tooth for tooth, burn for burn, all that. Um, but what a uneducated view of the law, considering there are, is already a law for the defense of anybody who is attacked, that you repay them tooth for tooth, eye for eye, life for life. Like that's already a very famous law <laughs> that Jesus quotes, right? So this is a secondary law that is talking about the baby. Like why, why would it be a repeat about a woman that gives birth? Like it is, it is talking about the baby. It is ignorant of the law to say that it's talking about the mother because there's already protections for the mother. This is specifically about a baby born under these circumstances. So... Um, I would say that's a powerful testimony amongst others in the Bible that talk about babies being humans <laughs> and them having life and worth and sinful from the mother's womb. All, the, all these references to babies being people in the womb, that a intentional killing of the baby in the womb is, is murder, as would any other intentional killing of a person be, save for uh, capital punishment and war. You know, those are the only two other instances I could think of where killing is not murder. Um, so again, I, I understand compromise, so I understand why Christian Democrats know they're making a compromise on abortion. Um, I would I would commend them to think about what they're getting in exchange for that compromise, and if it is really righteous in, again, in specific looking at God's law, does it favor one political party over the other? Um, just like in Jesus' day, God's law did favor the Pharisees more than the Sadducees. It didn't excuse the Pharisees for wickedness, and it didn't stop Jesus from calling them out, but obviously... The Pharisees were closer to God's law than the Pharisees, even if, or than the Sadducees, even if they were still far off and still rejected the Messiah. So in that way, I don't think Christians should think that the Republican Party is the Messiah Party. It's definitely not. It will not save the nation. It's not even biblically based these days. So we should not have a a complex where we think that they will enact God's well, heaven on earth. Um, but as reasonable people, we can decide which of these two parties is following God's law more. And I don't. I, I know there are Christian Democrats, real Christians who vote Democrats convictedly, um, but the Democratic Party isn't a Christian-loving party. They're openly anti-Christian. They they are the ones that strive to secularize the nation. Um, they took God out of their platform. The Republicans still have God in their platform. I don't know how long that will last, so granted, I'm not saying Republicans are great, um, but the Democrats took it out, I think, 10 years ago, I think when Barack Obama ran for his second term. They are pro-abortion. They're not just allowing for abortion. They are pro-abortion, the pro the use of abortion, pro-mandating the use of abortion across the U.S., or the, mandating the allowance of abortion across the U.S., um, pro-higher uh, taxes than the Bible allows, pro-welfare, which we just discussed, isn't righteous. Um, when done by the state. When done by the state. Uh, so, that, you know, again, without having to cite any weird scandals. I didn't have to cite any weird scandals about Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or Trump or anybody without having to cite any charts or figures. We just cited the Bible. We are coming to some Christian conversation about politics. And I really strongly, again, I said at the beginning of the episode, agree, uh, am convicted myself that we should not convict others of politics that aren't in the Bible. And we shouldn't forgive others politics that are in the Bible. We should have patience with them, but like we shouldn't l- let go of something that the Bible speaks clearly about. And so I don't want to let abortion go, even though it is super contentious and can definitely split churches. Uh, I don't think that we should compromise by saying that abortion is not murder. It, it, it is murder in, by the biblical stance. And so we shouldn't compromise on that. And, then, and in the same way, I don't think that we should compromise on things like prison or um, the welfare that is prescribed in the Bible from being a good thing or the lack of interest. The Bible talks about not charging your brother's interest and there are plenty of Christians out there charging their brother's interest. I don't think it's righteous. Um, we should we should not stay silent on those things. Using Christian wisdom to not just cause unnecessary rifts in the church, but those we should be convicted by the word of God and not be convicting others of things that aren't in the word of God. 
Theodore, do you have another divisive topic? Otherwise, I may have one that is really divisive these well, days. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to... So the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, those are biblical, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, <laughs> Governor Tim Walz's church uh, speaks the Sparkle Creed. Oh, no. Which, they speak the Sparkle Creed? Really? Uh, now, this is gossip right here. This is, just, this is Christian-related gossip. <laughs> Well, you can go on YouTube. This guy uh, uh, has like clips of their church services. He has uh, all the things on their website. Um, and it's a, just basic heretical uh, stuff. Uh, but anyway, um, I guess uh, still regarding like wealth, disparity, uh, that kind of stuff. There are plenty of people in the Old Testament and New Testament who have wealth. And it's not bad. And because they are Christian, uh, or because they have faith in God, they contribute their wealth or uh, contribute their wealth to the church, and they help people out. Um, but like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, you don't see these people going out of their way or traveling across the world to. Uh, live in rags and giving all their wealth to poor people. No, you see them succeeding where they are and treating people well where they are and uh, glorifying God. And you see that in the New Testament as well. There's a lot of examples in the book of Acts where it's not a bad thing to be wealthy. It's it's one kind, it, like a double blessing um, because if you're a Christian, you're going to heaven, that's a blessing. If you're wealthy, that's an earthly blessing. And it doesn't uh, make you evil because you use your wealth in a God-glorifying way. Um, and I was trying to go through the book of Luke. I didn't get all the way through it today. Um, but looking for examples of um, charity and wealth uh, aspects. And in Luke 12, starting at uh, verse 13, it says, someone in the crowd said to him, uh, said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, man who made me a judge or arbitra uh, arb arbitrator over you. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So there Jesus is outright calling out this guy for wanting his brother to split the inheritance with him. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what else here? And you got the parable of the, in Luke chapter 19, you have the parable of the talents where um, one is given one, one's given three and five, I think. Right. Oh, ten. One, five, and ten. So it, that's, that's a, it's a parable, but that's right there, inequality. Uh, and that's just a fact of life. People are given different things and they're blessed, uh, they're rewarded based on what they do with what they have. Um, if Jesus was a communist, think, that would have been a perfect time to say uh, down with the patriarchy and also with the money system Let's go form the Inca Empire, have no currency or banks. Because isn't isn't that in the same parable? You should have put the money in the bank so at least it gained some interest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that would to me, that would have been a wonderful time to also say, by the way, you see how evil this human system is of money? We shouldn't have that. So considering that that doesn't happen and instead money is used as a reward in some of his other parables, like the laborers are paid in money. Like some are paid for the full day, some are only paid the entire salary for just a couple of hours of work. To me, it suggests that God does grant rewards, either gifts or also, in this case, wealth, as he did in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah, and I think it, it's hard to put God in a box as far as like that exact parable you just referenced, Sebastian. It's clearly talking about God paying us eternal life regardless of the amount of work that we do um, not to say that our good works aren't good because they are but they are the thing that earn us salvation so mm -hmm. we shouldn't we shouldn't think that god is always somebody who demands work for 
um, pay because he gives us this gift with no work, right? This, this pay with no work um, that is eternal life. So in that way, we are welfare recipients of Christ, of God. Um, but in the other way, as we already discussed and Theodore mentioned, Christ, is, his mission is not just to feed and clothe people. He explicitly calls out people who he does give that free meal, feeding 5,000, um, and then feeding the 7,000 after that and a different amount before. He, he does this, and then the people follow him just wanting the bread and the fish as as be apt to do if your biggest expense is that hey this guy's giving it out for free it's like big money savings there plus it tastes good um <laughs> jesus calls them out and says they just live to feed their bellies and he warns the disciples to watch out for people who just live to consume right and by and large humanity it's not just the poor but humanity live to consume and so when you feed that appetite with welfare um you can see where the unrighteousness mm -hmm. can come from welfare. And so we see where God calls for, for helping the poor, um, but you should also see the dangers of modern welfare. Even if you didn't have sociological studies that showed you that, you could just use the Bible and see it. So we've talked about welfare. We've talked about... Uh, uh, and I just want... Did we want to transli uh, transition into the Republican stuff? We talked about a little bit of Republicans. So yes, we, we should be talking about Republican things okay and i uh oh one of the thoughts uh i get lost but the other thing is i uh googled uh what like the federal welfare system was in the history of the united states and the ai overview overview gave me the federal government did not have a welfare welfare system in the, in the first century of america uh, local governments and towns were responsible for helping the needy, but only when family and friends couldn't help. Poor houses, almshouses, and workhouses were used to care for the poor. Able-bodied men and women were generally not supported unless they worked. So that sounds like a pretty biblical uh, uh, view to me regarding welfare. That it should be the church, the family, um, maybe local government, uh, helping out if necessary. Um, but yeah, not expanding the scope of the federal government. And I think that's um, one of the main issues that Republicans have, because when you expand the scope of the government, it necessarily gets more power. And who knows where you go uh, with that. Um, and a friend recently reminded me, <laughs> um, in 1930 or 1933, when Hitler was declared the chancellor um and maybe soon after dictator mm -hmm. um it was just two months after he was declared chancellor that he started his concentration camp where he persecuted his political rivals and then obviously later that those became death camps um for just longer reasons Yes. Um, I don't know where you're getting with but that. But then, <laughs> so I suppose I could somehow transition uh, into why Republicans don't like that. Or uh, the Re Republicans' view of the government is for the government to not have too much power, um, to be small, um, because its purpose is to protect citizens uh, as opposed to opposing them, censoring them, uh, uh, whatever, uh, Christian Republicans, like I said earlier, want to protect the innocent um, and protect individual liberty. And um, so Luke 22, verse 36, Jesus tells his disciples, um, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one for personal protection. Mm -hmm. Sword um, weapon. And then Romans 13... Down. In Romans 13, 3 to 6, uh, Paul is saying, Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. But you have no fear of the one who is in authority, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Uh, therefore, one... Uh, must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities in, uh, for the authorities are ministers, 
of God attending to this very thing. So it shows here that uh, the purpose of government is to be a fear uh, or a terror to bad conduct and the government bears the sword in order to um, maintain justice and a fear to bad conduct. Mm -hmm. And that's why we pay taxes um, so that they are able to um, help the people out, um, get justice or be protected against uh, larger, scarier things. Which is and, a rejection which of... Is one, yeah. yeah, it's a rejection of like a lawless anarchy that some would promote. Um, not everybody on the Democratic side does this, but there's definitely a, a subsect who wants to defund police unions because they believe that any amount of force the government exerts will be used for evil, and therefore we should we should remove the ability for the government to enact laws. Right? We should remove their enforcers. We should remove police officers because police can be a force for evil, which I, I think we'd all agree that police can be a force for evil because government can be a force for evil. But there is space in a Christian, in, in the Bible, for the, the government to use force to enact its law. Like that is, that is a given role of government. So again, not having to even cite Hitler or anybody else, you can just look to the Bible and say, the Bible says that the government should have some authority to enact its laws with force, with the sword. So for libertarians and others that would say the government has no right to use force, that's not biblical. You had a controversial topic. But important fact is that the government should not be stronger than the whole of the people. Because when the government is stronger than the whole of the people, then they can do that dictator stuff. Yeah. Propaganda. I mean camps, whatever. It's very American to say, and I was also raised in America, so I want to say amen, hallelujah, um, that the government shouldn't be stronger than the people, go Second Amendment. Um, I would say that the Bible clearly has no law for swords. Like Jesus is able to freely say, go buy a sword because there is no law in God's law um, for sword purchasing. There is no law for sword purchasing or any weapon purchasing or anything in the Bible, um, in God's law. So I would say that we should be allowed to own guns, just like the Second Amendment says, and in that way, preserve liberty. Um, but the God's law, I don't think we should be under any strange impressions that God's law does not speak to the people being stronger than the government. Like, it doesn't have a statement on that. So I think it's, we go further than the Bible says when we say that the government can't be stronger than the people it's governing. Um, I think necessarily because the government in God's law can only take a 10% tax, they will always only be 10% as strong as the people. So like, because of the way it's set up, they will always be weaker than the people. But I don't think it's a, a truism to say that the people should always be stronger than the government. Because, I don't know, maybe the people spent all their money on booze. And then the government has bought all, you know, they spent their 10% on swords. And, like, there could be a scenario where the government is much stronger than the people. Um, and it's still be biblical. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready for this one? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm going to get attacked. It's Israel. <laughs> that's something uh, mm -hmm. that's very near and dear to either side of the of the aisle democrats republicans or even libertarians or any other color sizes that are out there oh my goodness after the conflict that's going on now in that part of the world the moment you say that name you will either instantly make enemies or make best friends with depending on the circles that you run into i'm going to I'm going to be fair, try to take a jab mostly at a lot of conservative people that are extremely pro-Israel. I'm not saying, I'm for disclaimer, I'm going to say abandon the nation, the modern day of Israel. But there's a lot of theology that unfortunately goes into the, the Republican Party support for, in Christians in the Republican Party that support the nation of Israel. It's been my, my take. Do you guys feel the same or do you think it's another reason that's that goes behind that we it's kind of kind of unrelated to the episode because it has to do with dispensationalism but like uh, we would be uh, without coaching you know without talking about dispensationalism specifically we would say that israel is just another nation yeah um, like any other and so it does not do any un unusual support from the united states um, there is definitely a contingent of christians who believe that, that israel is not just another nation and that um, righteousness is whether or not you support Israel or not. And so the U.S. will be counted unrighteous if we don't support Israel when the end times come and the, the one world government tries to take over Israel. I don't believe in that. 
Um, so that that is a statement that should be, you know, watch our other episodes because that's a whole mm-hmm. kind of worms to unpack. Um, I am a very Bible-believing, very strongly convicted of the Bible as you hear in this thing. So don't take me saying that I don't believe um, that Israel is special compared to other nations as me ignoring Revelation because I read through Revelation. I don't want to be liberal about Revelation. I am a pre-mill guy, pre-millennialism guy. Um, all that said, um, I agree with Sebastian in that Israel is it, the current state of Israel is not clearly enough defined in the Bible for us to make it a convicting dividing line between Christians. And so I do not believe U.S. politics should be hinged on whether or not Israel is supported. I think if you are Israeli, which none of us are, but if you are live in Israel, that you have the right to nationalism and national defense and whatever else. So mm-hmm. I, yep. I am supportive of Israel in that way. Um, I'm also supportive as far as like strategic military assets go to have an ally in that space. Um, I don't know that I would choose to continue to support of Israel if I was president, but that's that's a more subtle call than others. Um, kind of like Ukraine. Like Ukraine, I don't think it's a clear cut issue in whether or not you support Ukraine. It's clearly not a Bible thing, though. And so I would say we cannot convict our fellows to pass laws on that um, because it's not outlined in the Bible. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I would I would say it should not be a matter of Christian righteousness to support or not support Israel. I would say those who support Hamas are supporting war makers um, and like child killers. And, you know, <laughs> I think... As much as the Israeli army ends up killing children when they bomb hospitals to kill Hamasi rebels, um, Hamas rebels are intentionally hiding in hospitals so that children die so that they get good press. So, like, I don't know how you righteously support Hamas. So, kind of hard to not support Israel because of how wicked Hamas is. Um, but, you know, I don't think we should be um, confused that Israel is some super righteous nation just because Hamas is so wicked. Right. I only bring that up because I have seen in sermons too, multiple times over the years that Christians must defend and obviously from the Bible and using scripture to that's this is why we must defend the nation of Israel. I would say that the new Israel is the church so the Christian community must be protected and all and all of that. But to say that we must make US policy because this is in scripture, I just don't, I just don't see it there. And I also think people who make decisions on politics based on, again, things that the Bible doesn't speak to. So if you are voting Democrat because you think foreign policy will be better under Kamala, but you recognize all the other wickedness of the Democrat Party, and or vice versa, you're voting Republican because you think it will work out better for Israel and the Ukraine. I. I once again advise you, I call to you to use the Bible as the means by which you judge policy. And if you can't use the Bible to judge why supporting Ukraine is righteous or wicked, it probably shouldn't be a convicting reason why you vote for that party. Um, That's why I, I, I think, again, to circle back to the very beginning of this episode, I do think that politics should be a relatively simple matter of agreement for Christians when you read through God's law and his principles if it is explicitly stated in God's law or we can directly relate it to a principle of God's law that's very relevant, it should be a matter of agreement for all Christians, at least in the local church, um, if not bigger organizations of churches that say, yes, we all agree that, for instance, abortion is murder, and therefore it should be judged as murder in state courts. That doesn't mean that we go out enacting that law. It doesn't mean that we um, stump even, but at least we should be in agreement that that, that is the Christian perspective on that policy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we should keep our mouths shut Mm -hmm. uh, or or say that there is no Christian perspective on the Ukrainian war, for example, Um, meaning we should not have, the Christian perspective is we should not have policy relating to the Ukrainian war if we think it's not clear enough in the Bible. And I, I would argue it's not clear enough in the Bible whether or not we should have a stake in the Ukrainian war and therefore the U.S. should have no policy regarding the Ukrainian war. And I think it, it should be, it's such a touchy subject that it's not going to be simple, but I think there is a world where it could be simple to get Christians in alignment on politics, just like we're in alignment on theology. When, you know, 2,000 years ago, it was really, really hard to get aligned on theology. And now, for the most part, we're aligned on theology within local churches. I think in the same way, um, 200 years ago, Christians were mostly aligned on politics in a local church. Um, and now we've suddenly become so unaligned on politics, even within a local church. I do believe we can get aligned on politics and on theology mm-hmm. 
believe it or not. I think it is possible, but just not there today in the U.S. Yeah. Any any last comments, gentlemen? Politics. So that was very political, but I hope we kept it very focused on God. Um, we encourage you to comment if you have questions or you have disagreements with us on how um, on the law thing, should we even be looking at the law, how we're applying the law, is there something we're forgetting about the Democratic or Republic Party that, that makes it obvious, super obvious um, that Christians should be supporting one or the other, please comment because I would like to stay humble. I am a lifelong Republican voter, but I have been a lifelong several things that I've changed my mind on in the past. So I want to be correctable in this department, um, but you see where I'm coming from. I, I want to use the Bible to determine why I'm uh, voting for a particular party and i never want to identify as a republican first right like i happen to vote for the republican candidate but i really shouldn't call myself a republican because i'm really a christian the republican party doesn't define my politics god should amen and that i think all christians should say so that's why we have found our cause in serving the lord jesus christ i've been michael the man behind, sh- behind the machine and to my right your left has been sebastian the archivist and across the airwaves it's been Peter under the pc Thanks for listening. If you want to see the rest of our episodes, you got to find them on foundcause.podbean.com. They're somewhere there. Um, this one's up there. Other ones are up there. Check it out. But that's only audio. If you want to see our beautiful faces or the faces of our co-hosts when we have people on or we react to people, you're going to have to go to youtube.com forward slash a bunch of numbers. We actually don't have the domain for Found Cause. But on Facebook, we are facebook.com forward slash Found Cause. Um, look us up there. Find us on iTunes, Spotify, wherever else you might. Um, who stole Found Cause from us? I don't even know who did it. I, I don't think there is a Found Cause channel. But somebody has forward slash found cause. Somebody, somebody we um, until next time we talk about something completely different. Maybe we'll talk about somehow biblically relating domain name stealing to uh, the Bible. Well, who knows? Something really cool. Lots of views for that one. <laughs> Bye. See you later. Bye.